Uh, so when I was asked uh, to go into the House of Lords by Nick Clegg and Willie Rennie, the leader of the Scottish Party, I had an opportunity of choosing my title, so I was very lucky and able to, to be rather modest and adopt the entire river uh, as my title. Uh, but my former seat, it's confused some people, they think that I'm named after the, the cloth, um, so it's quite good I get office and tweed suits. Um, <laughs> but uh, the area that, that was from to Delic and Rondale, um, when I was an MSP for there, uh, my former seat uh, generated more than twice the amount of renewable energy than any other part of Scotland. And it's been an interest of mine since before I was an MSP, but then subsequently knowing the, knowing the rich potential that there are for renewables. But I wanted to start with saying that since, since May, really, and uh, certainly from the Scottish perspective, I come down, but across the country with the results of the elections. Have any of you joined since the election, or have you all yeah, joined since the election? I'd be interested in your thoughts after I've stopped Gavin. Um, I, my view is that we need to be doing some really serious deep thinking about what liberalism means and what going forward where, where we position ourselves. I joined the party 25 years ago, and the, even the political climate in that 25 years compared to say the previous 25 years has changed quite dramatically. I think most people in this country, unless they are at the real far extremes, but most people in a, in a broad way will call themselves liberals. I think that the society now compared to when I joined the party 25 years ago, and certainly the previous 25 years before that, is a much more progressive and open society than it was. I think our culture and our overall perspective in the country, again apart from the extremes at the edge, are a far more outward looking generation. This is probably the most international outward looking generation that we have. And we'll link it back to climate change in a moment. And I think that we are a fairer, more decent society where there is broadly less violence and there's more toleration. Mm -hmm. And in many respects, most people will think that they, as I say, they are liberal. So if everyone considers themselves to a large extent liberal, what is the role of a liberal party? And I don't think, and I've absolutely been very clear since the summer, that there is no automatic place for our party. There is no automatic right that our party needs to exist and it can only exist going forward by people voluntarily choosing um, a party that will broadly reflect the views. Now the flip side to that is over the last year I've been fortunate to travel and represent the party and also seen perhaps from a Scottish perspective some areas where uh, I'm more convinced than ever that a grouping that can be as attractive as possible is necessary. It's not automatic that it will exist, but it's absolutely necessary. We don't have a union at ease itself within the United Kingdom. <coughs> um, around the world, we may well have norms that liberals wrote 60 years ago on rule of law and universal principles of human rights, but they are not respected in many parts of the world and I've seen firsthand some of the challenges uh, in some of my own travels. Um, I, even within our Commonwealth that we'll be meeting with the Chogha meeting this week, I think it's more than two thirds of Commonwealth countries, um, homosexuality is a criminal offence in Commonwealth countries. Um, and there are I think areas where we are moving into a new Cold War relationship between large economic but industrial military complexes. And we also are seeing a, a, a more medieval-esque type friction between religious blocs and theology as a means of governing, which I didn't expect ever to see in my lifetime. And Parliament's debating it tomorrow as to whether there is some further military action on that. 
and also that with the need for the development goals and the very patchy developments that there are in some of a very unglobal world, uh, an unequal global world and the challenge of climate change, all of those aspects um, on a global scene, I think there is a, still a need for there to be a British liberal voice out in the world. And at home, I mentioned we have a, I think a, a union that isn't at ease with itself still within the United Kingdom. We saw in the general election one part of the United Kingdom being played out against another, which we haven't seen in, since the times of Parnell and the debates of Irish home rule in the 19th <coughs> century. This is, again, I didn't think I'd see it in my life, lifetime. And we're seeing governan governance on the basis of that too, with one part of the union being played against the other. I call it wolf at the door government because it suits a United Kingdom government elected on 37% of the vote, but predominantly an English government for the whole United Kingdom. And a Scottish government with 50% of the vote and 96% of all the MPs, although that's going down because they uh, keep resigning the whip. <laughs> <laughs> if it's one a month by the next general election, we'll give you a part of the I really can't necessarily guarantee that. Um, and uh, with that situation, with both those principal kind of governments that affect my life as a liberal politician, uh, power is concentrated in a remarkable degree into a very small number of people, either between the combining door between number 10 and number 11 Downing Street with the axis between the Chancellor, or in the Scottish Government where it's principally three ministers with an entire civil service as a pyramid that leads up to those two. And the consequence of that is that people are excluded from the process. Broadly, young people are excluded from the process, but also those who can't afford to have a voice. And I use my words carefully, afford to have a voice. If you're a taxpayer, you have a voice. If you're in recipient of support or if you're struggling, you really struggle to have a voice. And it took an unelected House of Lords to remind the power at the centre that they cannot treat people who are on low incomes like pawns in a political game. Mm -hmm. That was quite telling in my view. <coughs> uh, and that also uh, means that some of the choices that are made for policy choices are driven by the centre and increasingly the elite. And it means that we still remain an economically very unequal society. Uh, and we also have our challenges because there are very many parts of the country that are still struggling for our own development. I mentioned the sustainable development goals, the global goals. There are still parts of our country that are significantly way behind. We still have a situation in, in, in the country where I live where only 1% of looked after children will gain a higher education qualification. And, that, and they have the richest parent of all, the government. And the attainment levels are declining. And the opportunity that exists for a relatively small number in society at the top are phenomenal. And those that are lower down are still struggling. So we still have a very low degree of social mobility. So add all those together, in my view, um, there is a, an absolute need for us. Um, but, uh, and I'll come on to um, one of the areas where you asked me to speak about climate change, but I think it's linked because we probably need to stop for the next small amount of period and think about ourselves, but also think about ourselves in a different way. And I believe we, for the next period, should stop considering ourselves as a noun, as the Liberal Democrats. And we should all be thinking ourselves as an adjective and asking people to, to think about being liberal and to be liberal. And one of the best examples of that is the combination of climate change and development around the world. And uh, <coughs> we know that for all of the indexes, on global hunger, on poverty, on disease, disease alleviation, we've made considerable progress. But there is much more progress to be done. And all of the estimates from respected organisations such as the Overseas Development Institute showing that if the current trend of work, even with the development goals being agreed, the global goals, 
with the current trend of profile of investment, support, policies, we will not meet them. We will not meet them. And some of them we will reverse. In sub-Saharan Africa, we will reverse, unless the trend is changed. And when you combine the aspects of climate change, then principally these are the countries which are, uh, or these are people within the countries that are going to be uh, the worst off over the period of the 15 years. And then the challenge with India and with China, who are desperately wanting to develop part of their huge countries for their populations, then they see growth as the imperative and then climate alleviation as secondary. The two together, I think we desperately need there to be a strong global liberal voice and the United Kingdom can and should be taking a lead. When Michael Moore in the Commons, my former colleague in the Borders, uh, who sadly is no longer, he's one of the casualties in the general election, uh, he had a private member's bill, as you will know, uh, or you may know of, last, uh, last year, uh, had an opportunity for a private member's bill, and he chose to enshrine the law on 0.7% for GNI obligation for overseas development assistance. And I was responsible for taking that through the House of Lords against much stiff opposition from the progressives like uh, Lamont and Lawson and Michael Forsyth and uh, the, the people who said, who I, when I went to the House of Lords, sat in front of, uh, directly in front of them and rather a bizarre experience. So it was my privilege to deliver that bill. And we did deliver. And it was a Liberal Democrat private member's bill in the House of Lords for myself, and it was a Liberal Democrat minister, uh, Lindsay Northover, who was, at the dispatch, who was at the dispatch box. And I said, it was fairly cross party, but I said, I hope the Chamber doesn't mind when I introduced it in the second reading. I said, I hope the Chamber doesn't mind that uh, we select a partisan, because this is delivering, this bill is delivering a Liberal Party manifesto commitment. So the commitment was in the 1970 general election manifesto. So our party had uh, it as a commitment before the UN adopted it as a resolution. And that shows the, the depth, I think, of our outward feeling and thinking that it is uh, the same to have a view about wanting to challenge our own domestic priorities as we want to challenge our other world. And we, as a party, know no borders. If there's any party in the UK <coughs> that I believe is beyond borders, it is a Liberal Party. So the second challenge is on the climate change with COP21 in Paris. And we're seeing, without the Liberals at the core of this, we are seeing a retreat. On the good side, there's likely, I think, to be a deal. And there's been a lot of preparatory work in Lima and Warsaw, and learning the lessons from Copenhagen, uh, learning very significant lessons. There's been also work, interestingly, with the largest polluters, and there's been some really quite sophisticated discussions with, mentioned in India before, about those countries who are wanting to strive for, for development and for growth and secondary. And we've now got the whole suite of the individual plans per country. And these are all major steps. Uh, the difficulty is that they don't add up to bringing in global uh, temperatures below 2%. And if they are above 2%, then that means, in effect, that there will have been no net benefit in the world since 1992 when this was first put on the international agenda. Uh, and in addition, countries will likely to be needing to spend almost as much on mitigation measures of the impact of climate as the global fund which is aiming to be $100 billion to, to, to allow for there to be development of technologies to bring about clean energy. And we are at that really key point. And at that absolutely fundamental point, it is a bit of a tragedy that the United Kingdom government has decided to take mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. foot off the pedal. That's not mixing bad um, mm -hmm. analogies with the internal combustion engine. And an electric car, <laughs> they're taking their <laughs> foot off the pedal. Uh, we had put in place really some very far sighted and some radical work when Ed Davey was uh, Energy 
Secretary taking on board this year. And the recent energy bill, the recent, st the recent statements by Amber Rudd, the Secretary of State, changing the direction of it. I see it from a, from a scholarship perspective where the announcement of removing the support for onshore wind, 65% of the impact of that was in Scotland, not, not in England. Um, the cancelling of the carbon capture storage of the billion pounds allotted for that, now exclusively Scotland. Um, the, yes, we do have sunshine, we have more of it here, but still the investment is going into the photovoltaic were businesses in Scotland, which were, which were part of spin-off in, in industry. Uh, and one of them has uh, gone bust already because of the, the uh, reductions in the feed-in tariffs for, the, for, for energy. And the ripple effects are significant. Two weeks ago I was in Nairobi in the Kenyan Parliament and part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association work that I'm helping put together a, a handbook of, for parliamentarians on the sustainable development goals and climate change and bringing them together and aligning what potentially could be in the outcome in COP21 with the global goals. I'm passionate that they need to be absolutely aligned and that the governance comes with it and the delivery plans and with that. But there was a, um, an MP who, a Kenyan MP with a businessman uh, in Nairobi who runs a, a seeking support for a, a solar farm uh, which funds irrigation, which means that land can finally be made to put into good agricultural use because it had been stripped of trees by Maasai to build their homes. So it was a completely circuitry route. And the investment was a mixture of their own investment. But the principal investor was a British company. I mean, that even adds even more to it. Uh, which the, the day that I was there, the previous day, this chap received the phone call and they pulled all the money because the business was now about to go into administration in the UK because of the reductions in the, in the, the freedom tariffs announced by Amber Rudd for it. So the, uh, the ripple effect is much more than simply responding to a slightly right-wing electorate that says that renewables are bad. The net effect is that the UK will probably then uh, be in the, in the lower rung of the EU targets overall. So the EU is negotiating in COP21 on behalf of us all. And we're likely now to be in the lower rung. We were going to be in the top uh, with the trend that we're, of the support that we were doing. And even the Committee on Climate Change, which is chaired by a former Conservative Minister, has indicated that we will be falling down. But the government doesn't seem to be concerned because we're covered by the EU blanket position and we will, we will broadly meet where we are, but we're not going any further. So leadership has been taken away. And I think it's a, it's a personal tragedy, especially since I see going back to the bill when uh, I was, the, it was been a rather busy time for me because the, the following uh, day after I flew in back from Nairobi, flew out to Malaysia and was part of a, a, a group. As with the former Minister for Development in Australia, and she was saying that in the debates when they were having in Australia, when the Conservative, the, the, the Liberal Party uh, there, scrapped the internet there in the National Development Department, and they cut back on the development spending. She was using our example she didn't know it was going to an example, but she was using our example of not only meeting the target but enshrining it in the law as a case for developed countries, OECD countries, can do something differently and they can take leadership of the international stage knowing that that has a wider benefit which then can accrue back to the country. And we're, we're moving that apart. So, and I think that is broadly tragic. Now, all is not lost because we still have. Uh, 100 or uh, 108 active parliamentarians. Slight issues that 100 of them are not elected. Um, <laughs> <laughs> minor point, I keep, uh, Westminster, I keep talking about the over 100 liberal parliamentarians that exist. Uh, but we are taking the challenge to them. 
we need your help. We need people who joined us if they share our view to be saying to their friends and colleagues, these folk really need help because we need to be campaigning. And I've seen uh, on, a, on a personal level the problem areas, I've seen the challenges, I'm thinking with colleagues about how we address them, but I think that the position that we can take on climate change, the way that we can try and keep the pressure on the government so that we uh, still try and win an argument that we have to keep a target to be having electricity generated 100% by 2050, I believe, that there can be decarbonisation, that local authorities should be having much greater flexibility to put in uh, energy efficiency measures, even though the government has scrapped the zero carbon growth initiative. The big aspect, and I know that if it was a Liberal Democrat leading the talks on behalf of the UK, then we would be saying, the zero carbon Britain bill that is currently going through the British Parliament is a lead for the European Union, is a lead for the world, and help us learn from us. Because that would have been in the Queen's speech if we had been in a position of influence. In the Queen's speech, instead of an energy bill, which has cut support for the cheapest and most mature and most reliable form of energy generation, which has been cut, instead of cutting support for photovoltaic, instead of cutting for um, biomass support for individual houses, and instead of um, alienating almost the entire construction industry of the United Kingdom because they reduced the standards after all of the businesses geared up, trained up uh, for zero carbon walks, we would have been setting a target for a quarter of a million of green jobs in the British economy plus that. So that is, to me, one of the clearest examples of uh, showing that we were not the mini version of our bigger coalition partners. We were distinct. But others have set our brand for us in the broadest terms. We have depleted resources. We have uh, much less money than before. Um, so we only can develop and we can only grow by becoming a movement, a popular movement, a campaigning movement to address the challenges that still exist in this very different type of society. And I think that if our language is such that, for example, on climate change, if you believe that we should be having our target for a zero carbon Britain, then you are liberal and you need us so you have to support us. And across the piece, if you believe that our country should not be divided by one part being used to, for the political benefit of the other, I have a constitutional convention bill that's currently in Parliament at the moment, a more federal Britain. If you believe in that, a union that we should be working together for the greater good, then you are liberal and you need to support us because you need us. And right across the piece, we are reframe, reframing how we are approaching it, becoming an adjective rather than a noun, but also doing it with energy, with a smile, upbeat, I think that we've got the recipe of success. And the final thing I'll say is that I know that it can work because we've seen it in North America, not with Trump or Ted Cruz, but even more North, that the Liberal Party started the long campaign, uh, third in the polls, being written off. The brand had been seriously damaged. Uh, remember the previous general election in Canada was the polling day was two days before my election in the Scottish Parliament 2011 when we got a kicking in the Scottish Parliament election and I thought that's one hell of a battle and I'm so proved to be. Um, but they went down from 36, now they're 184. Uh, during the campaign, the leadership and um, Trudeau, and yes he did have a little bit of stardust from his father with the, the, the reputation of a, of a Trudeau. As prime minister, that's of course that's the case. But they made a they made a two or three big decisions. One was that they were going to frame their own policies as distinct as possible and talk about investment and supporting young people and opportunities. Second, they were going to be making Canada looking out into the world again, 
rather than feel the burden of the world and the challenges as Harper had done. And the third was to say that we are all Canadians. We all should have a degree of uh, common ground for the aims that we want to see. Of course, every province is strong and has its own identity. Pierre Trudeau Sr. said to the Québécois, be a master of your own house, but why not make a Canada? And he also said, which Trudeau Jr. had also used, was that Canadians like to be led, but they don't like to be pushed around. So, and the technique, quite remarkably, not a single negative advert, not a single negative pol uh, poster from the Liberal Party. And they caught a mood. And they went from third place to now, I don't know if any of you get any information from the Liberal Party in Canada, but if you got the email that showed the new Canadian cabinet, <laughs> it was just one of the most striking things that I've seen over the last month. And it shows that things can be done different. So that's what I want to say to you, that we've got to think seriously. The climate is different, the political environment is different, but the need is there. We have to probably think how we approach it differently. <coughs> when it comes to the global challenges, we should have heart that we are able and capable of addressing them. Um, and we need to keep the pressure on to make sure that the UK does too. Thank you.